Halloween is almost upon us and I am fully in the Halloween spirit. I have been for a while. I don't need any help and that's it. The end. Um, oh, but if any of you guys need help, I decided to make a list of Halloween media. Every year I like to revisit some of my favorite Halloween media from my childhood because my favorite kind of Halloween spirit is like spooky Halloween as opposed to scary Halloween. Like if ghosts, instead of looking like they're in the grudge, look like they're big squishy blobs with cartoon faces. That is the kind of Halloween I'm talking about. These aren't horror movies that are supposed to scare you. They are supposed to make you feel like you're a little kid and you're like sitting at home drinking apple cider about to go trick-or-treating. I made a list of my top 15. I already decided that the title's going to say 10. 10 just feels like a number that you put in titles, but it is 15. I made it 15 because I like a lot of things, so. Yeah. You're probably going to notice that a lot of this media is centered around a particular time frame because that's when I was a kid across that span of time. So if you're a millennial, this list will be super relatable. If you're older than a millennial, you can like hate on me for being an uncultured swine and not knowing the Halloween stuff from your childhood. And if you're younger than me, you'll still relate to this because they I think they just rerun all the same stuff today. They don't really make new stuff. Okay, now let's get to the list. Number 15 is Under Wraps. That's a mummy, cool! What are we gonna call him? How about Harold? And it's up to these three kids to help him find his way back home. This is a Disney Channel original movie, a DCOM. I didn't include them all, but make no mistake, Disney Channel completely delivers on Halloween movies. I think the reason they had so many when I was a kid is like, maybe they were making a modest one per year and just by the time I was watching, they had accrued a lot of them. Under Wraps is set at Halloween time. It has the boy and his monster plot. It's maybe not the best decom, but it is like a very classic one that I always remember when I think about them, but that's why it's low on the list. I also just really appreciate that it's a mummy movie. I feel like mummies are one of those Halloween monsters that show up to like round out a lineup, but they aren't usually the star player themselves. I feel like Halloween monsters have like waves of relevance. Like you'll see the whole gang around every year, but if you have a keen eye like I do, you will notice that there are certain monsters that kind of rule certain years. Last year was witches and skeletons. This year is Frankensteins and scarecrows. So anyway, it's only a matter of time before mummies have their year, but until then we can watch Under Wraps. Number 14, I don't know why I tried to hold up fingers like I have 14 fingers. Number 14 is Alvin and the Chipmunks meet the wolf man. I tried to foreshadow that this was going to be a weird list. It is. Yeah, when I was a kid, I liked Alvin and the Chipmunks, and this is their spookiest movie. They also have a movie where they meet Frankenstein, but I, as a discerning film critic, am too good for the Frankenstein movie, but I like the Wolfman one. This movie is about the Chipmunks having an evil next door neighbor who is secretly the Wolfman, and he bites Theodore, who starts turning into a werewolf, and also they're putting on a school play of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and they get into some real mortal peril, and it's a musical. You're probably like, why did this movie need to star the chipmunks? And like, that's kind of all the chipmunk movies. There's, there's no reason. The whole thing of the chipmunks is that they're anthropomorphic chipmunks and they're music stars. And in most of their stories, only one of those things is relevant. And in this movie, neither of those things is relevant. It's just a complete story on its own. Like, even when they're singing, it's usually in narration to the audience, not actually singing in the events of the story. They're definitely not music stars because they're in a school play. I kind of wish this was just a Halloween story about brothers because it does kind of stand on its own, but I have to appreciate it for what it is. And I did always make time to watch it when it was on Cartoon Network, but I did put it low on the list because honestly, when you get older, trying to watch chipmunk voices becomes really intolerable. Maybe I'll just watch it at like three quarter speed and have that nightmare experience. Don't you get it? She's right! There's a monster on our own block! 
Oh, please. Number 13 is Paranorman. It's set at Halloween time. It has retro horror kitsch. There are zombies. There's another school play. This one's about the Salem witch trials. Clearly I have beats and it's hitting them all. I feel like a lot of you have already seen this movie. It doesn't really need my recommendation. And also I'm too ancient for it to be that nostalgic for me. So I put it kind of low on the list. And that's also why I'm not going to go into too much detail about it, but it's good. And that's why it deserved a place on here. This is on the list instead of Coraline, because Coraline is not a Halloween movie. It's set in the springtime. Number 12 is The Ghost and Mr. Chicken. This is the weirdest one on the list. I'm guessing a lot of you haven't seen it. It's a Don Knotts comedy about a cowardly reporter who has to spend the night in the local haunted murder house. It has a lot of memorable one-liners and some good spooky ambiance, like there's an organ that plays itself and a painting that bleeds blood. But what really tips it over the edge is the theme song, which will get stuck in your head forever once you hear it. Actually, if you look the theme song up on YouTube and you scroll down to the comments, all of the comments are people just retyping their favorite memorable one-liner. And like, most of the one-liners are different one-liners. That's a lot of memorable one-liners. I think that's a good endorsement. Number 11 is Don't Look Under the Bed. This is another Disney Channel original, but here's what makes it unique. This is considered the scariest of the Disney Channel originals. This movie is so scary, and so many parents complained that, I don't know if this is still the practice, but for a time, Disney would only show this movie once a year on Halloween night. The story itself is not overtly Halloween-y. It's about a teenage girl who's being terrorized by the boogeyman, and she has to try to stop it by teaming up with her little brother's imaginary friend. I liked how spooky this movie was. It had some cool locations. I thought the story was really creative. And also the stakes get a lot higher than some other Disney Channel movies of the time. It has some cool boogeyman and imaginary friend lore. It even has some twists throughout the story, which when I was a kid, blew my mind. I don't know how they hold up because I can't recreate the experience of watching it for the first time, but like, maybe if you guys do, you can tell me. I always really loved this one, and I would probably put it higher if it had a little bit more to do with Halloween. Number 10 is the Boy Meets World Halloween Special, which is an episode called And Then There Was Sean. This is basically Scream for babies. They even have some jokes specifically referencing Scream, and I know what you did last summer, but it worked and it was funny and it was bold to see Disney Channel doing a Halloween special where beloved characters are getting stabbed and crushed and shoved out of windows to their deaths. I don't think Hannah Montana ever did that for any holiday. I thought a lot of the jokes were solid and it holds up and it takes me back to a time when Disney Channel sitcoms were actually good. It's definitely that the new ones are bad and the old ones were good. And it's not that I'm predisposed to like the ones from my childhood better and hate the unfamiliar, it's that the new ones are bad. The reason this special is on the lower half of the list is that they tried to justify its place in the overarching story of the show and it's really weird. Like, Boy Meets World follows these characters through years of their lives and it tracks their developing relationships and God forbid they have one Halloween episode where they take a break from that. This Halloween special has to be important to the canon. So instead of just having a framing device like, oh, one of the characters had a nightmare, they have to make it part of some psyche shattering revelation about how Sean needs his friend's relationships to succeed because of his own baggage from coming from a broken home. Why are you doing this to us? It was really weird, especially when you're watching it when you're like six. Submitted for the approval of the Midnight Society. <laughs> oh my god, please let this get enough views to justify getting glitter all over my room. Number nine is Are You Afraid of the Dark? The quality of these was pretty consistent, so I feel like you couldn't really go wrong with just picking one and jumping in, but it did feel like cheating to pick a whole series. So for a quick impression, I would recommend the Tale of the Shiny Red Bicycle, The Tale of the Laugh in the Dark, and The Tale of the Silent Servant. I like them all for different reasons, but the last one has a scarecrow, and remember, 2018 is the year of the scarecrow. Let's cough drop it up. I feel so out of it. I think I do have a fever. I mean, I'm also wearing a sweater and a hot hat. 
A lot of Are You Afraid of the Dark episodes are based on urban legends, and some of them feel straight up stolen from Goosebumps or scary stories to tell in the dark. That's why this one isn't higher on the list. And also, I said the quality was consistent. I didn't say it was consistently great. The real strength is just the total package, the title, the theme song. Just seeing the theme song and the intro stuff come on when I was a kid, would terrify me and send me running out of the room. I was a very cowardly child. The framing device is so good where there's this secret society of kids who meet in the woods at night to tell scary stories around a campfire. There are better horror anthologies, but I can't have a Halloween list without including this show. Number eight, it's The Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. Again, it's a classic, not gonna go too deep into it, but it deserves a place on the list. It's so full of classic Halloween images it's so iconic, I don't even have to say which parts are iconic because you already know. I will say that this one has a special place in my heart because I always loved pumpkins and jack-o'-lanterns and the idea of the great pumpkin. I was a pumpkin for Halloween for most of my young life. The year I outgrew my pumpkin costume, I was extremely upset. I'm a big fan of pumpkin heavy media. Maybe 2019 will be the year of the pumpkin. Number seven, Over the Garden Wall. Speaking of pumpkin heavy media, let's talk about Over the Garden Wall. I know I said it was cheating to include a whole series, but this is a mini-series, so this story has everything. Prominently featured autumn leaves, skeletons, spooky trees, death-related intrigue, creepy old ladies, folk tales. It's set on Halloween, and my personal favorite, it has a whole sequence set in a pumpkin-headed farming community while they're having a creepy harvest. Even if you just put it on on mute, it has such good autumn imagery, but also it has really good music, so don't put it on on mute. Number six, the Hey Arnold. Oh, it's hair. I thought it was a spider web. Number six is the Hey Arnold episode, The Ghost Train. Hey Arnold is my favorite cartoon show, and it had some really good spooky episodes. They all kind of followed the formula of character hears ghost story, character investigates ghost story, character debunks ghost story. Or did they? The other spooky episodes are good too. The second best is The Headless Cabbie. They also had Four-Eyed Jack and Sid the Vampire Hunter. But Ghost Train is just the best example of the formula. It has the best premise. Remember, the only thing better than a ghost is a ghost train. The atmosphere in this one is really good, the creepy tale, and what pushes it over the top is the song at the end. They have this amazing blues song about the haunted train and the crazy engineer, and it deserves to be on every Halloween mix. Number five, the Goosebumps Escape from Horror Land game. This isn't even a movie, it's a computer game. It's kind of old, but it oozes Halloween so powerfully. It also integrates live action cutscenes, which was like really cutting edge at the time. So it, you are getting a story. It's kind of like watching a thing. Never know what's real here and what's not. But either way, it's always totally terrifying. Like here, for instance. Werewolf Village. Oh, yeah. Get what I mean? I'm freaking out. And of course, it has to be a full moon. It's a point and click adventure, so you really feel like you're exploring all these awesome environments like the werewolf village, a vampire's castle, a creepy farmhouse. I really doubt that this game is being sold anymore, but there's probably a way to torrent it. And frankly, I'm surprised it never made a comeback. It has Jeff Goldblum in it as the vampire, and he's like a meme right now, but people are still sleeping on this game. Hey. Stay away from me. This was one of my favorite games as a kid. I always wished that Werewolf Village was a real land in a theme park somewhere, and I put it really high on the list, so I hope I convinced you guys to check it out. Number four is Halloween Town. Oops, I forgot to hold up this pile of DVDs for the thumbnail. This is the last Disney Channel original movie on the list, I promise but it is the highest ranked for a reason. It's about a bunch of kids who are not allowed to celebrate Halloween and they don't know why, and then they find out that their grandma is secretly a witch and that she lives year round in Halloween Town, which is just like a normal suburb, but it's full of Halloween monsters and they celebrate Halloween basically every day. Also, Debbie Reynolds is the grandma witch and she's like selling it. They made like four of these and I also like the sequel, Halloween Town 2 Calabar's Revenge. I have not seen the other two and I do know that they recast the lead at some point, which is a travesty. I love Halloween Town and I always wanted to go there and I found out that the town in Oregon where they shot it has a Halloween Town festival every year and they bring out the big pumpkin into the town square and they have a pumpkin lighting ceremony and the cast of the show goes. For some reason they refer to the giant pumpkin as the orange pumpkin. 
even though it's giant, so I don't know how being orange is the defining trait of that pumpkin. Anyway, I know all this because I was dangerously close to booking myself a trip out there this year and getting tickets to the Calabar meet and greet pizza party someday. Number three, those Halloween cookies that have shapes stamped onto them. Cookies are media, they count. This is an oddball, but it's high on the list for a reason. I don't think I've ever had a single Halloween without these cookies. They do make these cookies year round and have like different shapes printed on them for different holidays or like cartoon characters, but I associate them with Halloween. They used to have like different Halloween shapes so you could choose like chocolate ones with ghosts in the middle or bats. I feel like I can't be alone in having eaten these cookies for years. If you're like not from America and you're like, what are those? They're just sugar cookies. like just basic sugar cookies, and I don't even really like sugar cookies, like I usually won't even eat them if they're in front of me, let alone going to the effort of getting them at the store and baking them at home in my own oven. But something about these, they're just really good and they remind me of Halloween. Okay, time for number two. Number two is a movie that I always think of when I think of Halloween. When I was a kid, it played so often on TV that I think I would see it not only every year, but like three or four times every year. Number two is Scooby-Doo and the Ghoul School. You all thought I was gonna say Hocus Pocus. Ghoul School was rerun again and again and again, presumably because it cost like $3 to license. I have to say, I don't even understand the circumstances that could have led to this movie being made. This movie is about Shaggy, Scooby-Doo, and Scrappy-Doo becoming gym teachers at a boarding school for the daughters of famous monsters. Is this like the chipmunk movies where like somebody just wrote a movie and then they decided to use characters that already had brand recognition? Scooby-Doo has run for so long and had so many different series and my favorite thing about it is that the canon just like doesn't exist. Why isn't the rest of the mystery gang there? What is this world where monsters are real and live freely among humans? Where is Shaggy at in his life path that he ended up a gym teacher at an all-girls boarding school? How did that come about? Why would he ever be scared of monsters again if he's family friends with most of them? Where does this fall on the grand timeline of this series? I searched Scooby-Doo forums and the answer is Nobody knows and it doesn't matter. I love all the ambiance of the school in this movie and the designs of the monster girls. The pacing and timing of everything is also extremely bizarre. Like the story just stops in the middle for an extended volleyball game sequence. You guys know how Hocus Pocus had like a huge nostalgic resurgence in the last few years and like now it's the most common millennial Halloween costume and Spirit Halloween store has a big merch section devoted to it and it has theme park shows. I want Ghoul School to be next for this. For the record, that's why Hocus Pocus is not on this list. It, everyone's already watching it. All right, now it's time to move on to my top pick. Number one is The Haunting Hour, Return of the Pumpkin Heads. Yeah, nobody saw this coming. This is my number one choice of Halloween children's media. It's, it's the pinnacle. So R.L. Stein's The Haunting Hour is a horror anthology children's series that started airing on Discovery Family in 2010. It's basically just a reboot of the old Goosebumps TV show. A handful of the stories are from the Haunting Hour anthology book, but most of them are original and some of them, like the Pumpkinheads, are just straight up Goosebumps monsters. Anyway, my hot take is that this is the best horror anthology children's series out there. Like, it's better than the original Goosebumps, it's better than Are You Afraid of the Dark, by like, a lot. I've seen every episode. I could do a top 10 list just of episodes of this series. The stories are better, the acting is better, the twists are better. It's got a lot of good creepy concepts and also a good ratio of downer endings to happy endings, so you don't always know what you're gonna get. But anyway, I need to tell you about Return of the Pumpkin Heads. The episode opens and it's a lot more camp goosebumpy than a lot of the other episodes in the series. Like initially it just seems like they're hitting all the beats in this classic creepy story in the most straightforward and goofy way. You have two snotty teens who are complaining because their parents made them move to a creepy old house in the middle of nowhere on Halloween night. The parents are trying to be upbeat, the kids are complaining, and their dialogue is really lame and old fashioned. Looks like hippies lived here. Yeah. Psycho hippies. So this episode is from the last season of this show. So I was watching like, this is weird. They're not usually like this. And then it's like 
It's hard to describe, but the episode just kind of starts to melt. This creepy neighborhood kid comes to the fence to like warn the main characters about their house, which is again very cliche, but just like the way this kid delivers his lines. Kids from town started going missing, always around Halloween. There are rumors Palmer took them. Last Halloween, one of Palmer's victims escaped. When he got to the police station, all he could say was that pumpkin heads got them. The amount of contempt this child actor delivers it with is so weird. And what happened to Palmer? He's dead. Then the parents start acting weird. Like, instead of just upbeat, trying to keep a happy attitude, they start acting like crazy cartoon characters. And, like, the teens become more nuanced. Be Halloween. Ooh, this night will make you scream. Ah! Hey, I'm glad you guys are back. <laughs> See how bad. And then it just completely devolves into true horror. Like, characters are dying left and right in terrifying ways. I don't want to spoil it too much beyond that. Insanely, this is only a 22-minute episode. It packs a lot in. The dialogue is so weird and cheesy and classic goosebumps, but the actors are delivering it with total conviction, and it's contrasted by really scary imagery. It's set at this creepy house that feels like it's on a film set, so it just kind of adds to the surreal horror of it. Even when they go outside the house, they feel so isolated from the outside world, and like, their phones don't work, and you can't see beyond the gate. You have scarecrows, creepy noises, skeleton boy. Actually, believe skeleton boy. Skeleton boy. I thought it was skeleton boy. Nice try, skeleton boy. You really think it's skeleton boy? Chill out, lady. We're looking for skeleton boy. I'm not gonna be punked by a skeleton boy. It's set on Halloween. They're literally being murdered by pumpkins. And remember, 2019 is going to be the year of the pumpkin. Even the title is great. To add to the surreal creepiness of this episode, you basically have to go on a scavenger hunt to try to watch it anywhere. It wasn't included in any of the DVD collections of this series. It's not on Amazon or Netflix or iTunes. I couldn't find any legitimate way to buy it. And it's also pretty hard to find an illegitimate copy. It's hard to even Google because there's another episode of this series that's called Just Pumpkin Heads. And that one's more widely circulated, so that one always pops up when you try to search it. It actually took me a hot minute to convince myself I hadn't completely hallucinated this episode. And like, in a way, doesn't that make it better? So that's my list. Whether you're going to be sitting at home alone on Halloween night being sad, or you'd just like to have an intense marathon beforehand, I highly recommend this list. In the comments below, tell me your watch list, but only if it's the same as mine, and like, title it my Halloween watch list, as if it was your own idea, but then like put mine and like in the same order, just identical. We're both on a mission, we'll keep on searching. Months on a mission, whether by day or moonlight. Months on a mission, we'll keep on working. Months on a mission, make it safe out at night. This particular pumpkin I have had since I was a pumpkin obsessed three year old and his name is Pump because first of all I wasn't creative and secondly because I was so young that I had not even heard the phrase jack-o-lantern before. It was not in my vocabulary yet. Like had I known I might have named him Jack but to my knowledge at that time I thought this was just also called a pumpkin. I tried, you know.